I think vaping is one of the biggest issues our generation needs to address. I see it every single day. It's honestly kind of terrifying how normalized it's getting. One in eight high school students is vaping, and approximately one in 20 middle school students is vaping. So are you addicted to vapes? Yeah. Friends, family, everyone. You see it everywhere. I mean, it's something that I've tried like at parties and stuff. Nicotine's an addictive substance. It has all those other chemicals in it. They are getting our children addicted. You have school administrators. They're in a panic mode. It's an epidemic in the schools. They don't know what to do. A North Carolina high school is closing half its bathrooms after disruptions caused by vaping. You ask counselors, you ask the pediatricians or the family doctors, you ask the parents. Finally, you ask the kids, and they'll tell you it's a problem. It's been noticeable since I was in sixth grade. It's starting to get younger and younger. Kids even before the age of 13 are trying vapes. Actually, a lot of my friends start vaping in middle school. They would conceal them, and then whenever we would go outside for gym, that's when they would just start vaping, and then kind of like a circle huddled around them. Any high school anywhere across the state at any given time, you look in a classroom, three of those students are vaping. I started when I was 16, and yes, I still do. I guess I started in eighth grade. I think it was 14. The discreetness of them as well allows them to be used practically anywhere. I often see kids vaping in bathrooms, in parks, at the back of the bus, their own cars when they're driving to school. Bathrooms. They would vape in the stalls and stuff. I see it a lot of the time at school. Um, during passing period, in between period. Some kids would do it in class and they'd like, you know, hide it under their shirt or hoodie. Definitely when there's a substitute teacher. Because you can just shove it up like your hoodie sleeve or in your pocket. It is so addicting. People have no idea. Vaping in particular, these products contain hundreds of chemicals. Then you couple that with the nicotine that we find in these products. And for adolescent minds, nicotine is very harmful. It, it inhibits development in many cases. We're heating up this liquid, we're inhaling it. That liquid then cools down and it coats the lungs, not allowing the lungs to do their job as well as they could or should be doing. So it impacts respiratory health quite a bit. It's a common occurrence to have such terrible health issues. Vaping-related lip and pneumonia, popcorn lung, and collapsed lung. How hard is it for young people to get vapes? Do you have a receipt? I don't think it's difficult at all. Because many shops don't ask kids for their ID. I think it's so popular due to how vape companies market. They specifically set out for teenagers because they use enticing colors and enticing flavors. Flavors maybe like fruits or candy and different flavors like pina colada and blue raspberries. Like berry and grape. Cherry, banana, grape. However, it's more widespread than it ever was simply because of the quantity that's being produced. Earlier this afternoon, lawmakers made an unexpected move to create new regulations around vaping. There is new legislation in North Carolina. A bill on the way to the governor's desk tonight would ban the sale of any vaping products that are not already approved by the FDA. What do you think about that? I think this is really important to sort of clear the air on, on this issue, no pun intended. So this bill, you have to have FDA authorization to sell your products here. Right. All of those products are owned by Big Tobacco. Getting that something. So isn't this just helping Big Tobacco? I don't know if I can answer that question. Talk about these companies. Are they marketing to kids? Hell yeah. All day long. The bottom line is that these vape companies are concerned with making money. They could care less if they kill your kid along the way. My name is Charlene Zorn, and I'm going to be talking about my stepson, Solomon. He idolized his father and his brother. They were his whole world. Played football. He liked playing. He just, you know, liked to get out on the field and to be aggressive. And he was a typical boy. We were talking about the other day. When he was little, he had these little football gloves that if we were outside and he had the ball, he always had to have these gloves on. It just is who he was. Solomon was 15 when he got what his doctor thought was bronchitis. No matter how much medication they gave him, and heavy breathing treatments and heavy steroids and inhalers, 
he wasn't getting better. Get it, boy. Get it. He was a healthy, active football player. I mean, he couldn't walk to the bus stop. He couldn't walk from the house to the bus stop because it was too much. Finally, he's like, time to see the pulmonologist. And she immediately knew. She immediately knew it was from vaping. And she asked him and he admitted it. His family had no idea he'd been vaping for more than a year or just how bad his health was about to get. He got sick in April of 2023. On June 16th, he collapsed. His dad got home from work and found him passed out and had talked to him on the phone 15, 20 minutes before that. It took him about 77 minutes between his dad trying to resuscitate him and the paramedics to get him stable enough to transport him to the hospital. He just had too much lack of oxygen. The hardest thing in the world is to watch your child on a ventilator and to know there's nothing you can do and to know that it was 100% preventable. His family had to make the agonizing decision to take him off life support. He died from vaping. The vaping caused popcorn lungs, which basically destroys your lungs. It breaks the lining of your lungs down. It takes your ability to breathe away. He's got congestive heart failure, so his lungs, his heart, everything was filling up with fluid. And he basically drowned in his own fluid. But tell me about the funeral and, and what you said to his teammates. We didn't even know that the football team was going to come. And they all showed up in their jerseys. And when I walked into the church and saw 40 or 50 high school age boys sitting there, knowing that my child was not one of them, it broke me. It broke me like nothing ever has. After the funeral, when they were leaving, we spoke to every child, every one of those kids, and begged them, please don't vape. And that's what she does now, tells his story in the sincere hope it stops even one kid from ever trying it. Looking back, are, are there signs you think you guys missed? I'm sure there are. I don't know how there weren't. Where do you think he was getting the vapes? His friends. He said, he told us, he got them from his friends. Nobody should feel like my family does, ever. You must be 21 under federal law to buy tobacco products. In North Carolina, state law is still 18 and up. And it's hard because there's a damn vape shop on every corner in every town. And even though the law says that they can't sell vapes to minors, they sure do. But they don't card, I can tell you that much. As someone in tobacco prevention, I mean, how easy is it for a teen to get vapes? It's it's fairly easy. That plays out in the numbers that we, we see. One in eight high school students vape in North Carolina. Start please with my name is. It's not just the numbers. You're gonna look right into the camera. It's what we heard from every young person we interviewed, that kids who want to vape can. We talked to young people in anti-tobacco groups. And I've seen it firsthand where once it starts with someone else, then it spreads to another one, and the whole friend group starts vaping. Yeah, so actually my football teammates, we were using vapes before and after practice. We interviewed a teen in treatment for vaping. I couldn't go to sleep without it. And talked to young people we met on the street. It's just kind of like everyone does it. They all said vapes are easy to come by no matter how old you are. And kids also get them from their friends. And where their friends get it is vape stores. I always paid like someone in my grade to go get them for me. Like just about anybody could get access to vaping. I mean, there's so many vape stores. How is this gonna work? So we checked stores ourselves. How are high schoolers even able to have these devices in the first place? So I'm gonna put this on you, this is a camera, and we just wanna see if you get carded. Maybe the fact that they can walk across the street and purchase a vape. Did they card you? No. Maybe that's the good reason why. Next. Okay, what else? What are we missing? A big thing that we're missing here is how we got to this point. It's really crazy and it started with Jewel. I was one of these folks who saw the trend lines 
of how much high schoolers were stopping smoking. Uh, and then all of a sudden some mad scientist in California came up with a new way to deliver nicotine. Juul was one of the first companies to produce synthetic nicotine in a way that wasn't cost prohibitive. Nicotine in and of itself is very astringent, tastes pretty nasty, but with Juul, they were able to manipulate that pH level to lower it so it didn't taste as bad, so people could get deeper inhales, take in more. That is a recipe for addiction. We have a generation of youth who are now addicted to e-cigarettes. We had worked for decades in North Carolina to prevent this and recognize that Really, one company was going after kids. North Carolina Attorney General's Office commenced an investigation into Juul. And what they did was they used flavors to attract kids. They used very high concentration of nicotine to get kids addicted quicker because their mind was, if we can get them addicted, they're a customer for life. And then they marketed the product aggressively. They used Instagram and these social media influencers to make it look so cool uh, so that teenagers wanted to replicate that lifestyle. What's so sad is that it worked beyond their wildest imagination. North Carolina was the first state to sue Joel. They settled before it went to trial. And we won $48 million plus a series of changes to how they do business to protect young people. It really brought resources into North Carolina, but then while researchers were focusing on Juul, the industry was creating products like Elf Bar or Esco. And when I ask adults, have you ever heard of that? They say, no. I said, well, those are the number one and two products that were used by youth around the United States in 2023. New vape companies and products have saturated the market. They don't look like ugly, gross, scary, smelly cigarettes that they learned about in school. They look like the latest, greatest tech device. I can see now vape products have Bluetooth connection or even Wi-Fi that students can connect to. I even saw a vape that looked like a USB uh, stick. Make it look like pens. I don't know any adult smoker who has use for a vape pen that looks like a highlighter. I mean, why are they making vapes that look like Yoda? Why are they making a vape that looks like a highlighter marker or goes inside a hoodie? In 2023, the FDA sent warning letters to 15 companies who sold vapes that look like cartoon characters school supplies like a highlighter, a vape that looked like a camera, and one disguised as a coffee cup. This is a game of whack-a-mole at this point, and what we need in this country is a national standard of no flavors, because flavors are what attract kids. According to the CDC, vapes can contain cancer-causing chemicals, heavy metals, and some flavors linked to serious lung disease. We know that approximately 90% of high schoolers and 95% of middle schoolers who vape use flavored products. Why are they tasting like Fruit Loops? No 50-year-old wants something that tastes like Fruit Loops. Those flavorings often have harmful effects. We have products coming in from all different places. So these are not all American-made products. Eight hundred shops in Wake County can sell tobacco products, and more than thirteen thousand stores sell tobacco products across the state. The more you see it, the more you think everyone does it. Gorgia, one of the teenagers we met at the Poe Center for Health Education, started counting the vape stores near her home. I was passing by 17 vape stores, and you can double it to 34 because I was driving every day from my home to my school and then school and back home. Nikhil, another teen advocate, did a project where he mapped out all of the vaping stores near his high school in Raleigh. There were a total of 86 vaping and tobacco outlets within two and a half miles of Enloe High School. So with the amount of vaping outlets near a high school, it makes it super easy to purchase a device where you can vape. I'm Delaney Kearns, I'm 21. We sent a news production assistant at WREL into a dozen vape stores to see who would ask for an ID. Thank you. Thanks so much. Y'all have a good one. This is a button cam. We're going to put this on you and then just send you into the stores. And really, we just want to see when you buy a vape if they ask for your ID. So we're going to get you a, a button up shirt. We need something with buttons. All right, shirt is on. I'm going to put this on. It goes right through the buttonhole. Delaney is 21, so we weren't breaking federal law. 
even though in North Carolina, the age to buy tobacco is still 18. Either way, stores must ask young people for an ID before selling to them. We hit vape stores all over Raleigh, including some on NC State's campus. Do you have a receipt? Yes. What happened? Uh, I just pointed at it. I said, can I have that one? Thank you so much. And um, yeah, then I paid and left. I never got asked about my ID. This happened at every shop on day one. You guys don't have like elf bars or anything. Thank you, have a good day. All right, well, thank you so much. Did anyone say, oh, you don't have your ID, you can't get this? No. The next day, we hit six more stores, including a drive through No questions were ever asked about ID or age. Thank you so much, you have a good one. Just two out of the 12 total shops said she needed an ID to buy a vape. And you have all these products, you don't even vape. <laughs> no, I've never vaped a day in my life and I don't plan on it. <laughs> well, I think it's a pretty big problem. State Representative for Southern Wake County, Aaron Paré, sponsored House Bill 900, known as the Vaping Registry Bill. Governor Cooper signed it into law. So House Bill 900 would create a registry under the Department of Revenue so everybody can see all of the products that have been approved through an FDA federal certification process that would remove a lot of illegal product that is right now on the shelves in North Carolina. China produces over 90% of the world's vaping devices. The country has banned flavors in their country, but still makes and ships flavored vapes to the U.S. One reason, Senator Paul Lowe from Winston-Salem supports the bill. And they say in the country they make it in, it is not to be sold to our people. Well, maybe we shouldn't sell it to ours either. Tobacco prevention advocates say under the new law, a lot of foreign vape products would no longer be allowed to be sold in North Carolina. It makes it anybody who has not applied for pre-market authorization, those products are not going to be allowed for sale. So those are a lot of the, the products that are coming from outside of the United States. But advocates say there is a big loophole in this law. Companies who have applied for pre-market authorization and are waiting on an answer can still sell here. And how many is that are we talking? Thousands, um, hundreds of thousands. In terms of keeping these products off the shelf, I'm not sure the way the legislation is currently written, it's going to be able to do that. Companies denied FDA authorization who have appealed the decision can also still sell vape products under the new law. Something Pere said was added as a provision when the bill went through the Senate side. And so those products, even through that appeal or litigation, would still be able to sell their product while that's ongoing. And so that's the loophole that you're talking about. It's just a comes down to a policy call on both accounts. It seems like a pretty big loophole. You're going to have these companies that you're talking about still being able to, to sell. I don't think that this bill is perfect. I think it is a big step in the right direction. Groups like the American Lung Association say this bill benefits one industry greatly, big tobacco. Several of the big tobacco companies produce vape and e-cigarette products. This is about market share for them because they are the big conglomerates in this industry and not about protecting youth from getting addicted. There are just 34 vape or e-cigarette products out there authorized by the FDA. 26 of those products are owned by two big tobacco companies, Enjoy, owned by Altria, formerly Philip Morris, and Reynolds America in Winston-Salem. Senator Lowe represents Winston-Salem. You have to have FDA authorization to sell your products here. Right. All of those products are owned by big tobacco. Isn't that something? So isn't this just helping big tobacco? I don't know if I can answer that question. Um, I haven't researched every company that has a product or every company that's on that list. The list isn't that long, just 34 products owned by three companies, two of which are big tobacco. So this bill essentially would eliminate, you know, their competition. What do you say to that? I think that, that that is true to an extent. Does it eliminate a lot of illegal product that isn't big tobacco? Yes, but they're illegal. But because of the loophole, thousands of companies waiting for authorization or fighting an existing order are allowed to sell here as well. 
I'm worried that it's not going to have the impact that folks think in terms of access. There is something many advocates say would have an impact raising the age to buy tobacco products in North Carolina to 21. North Carolina is one of the last states to still be 18. More than 90% of everyone who is addicted became addicted in their teenage years. If we can delay people ever using until they're 21, the likelihood of addiction is very, very low. You shouldn't be able to buy these drugs uh, until you're 21. But neither lawmaker had a clear stance. Why not in this bill, when you're addressing some of these issues, why not raise that age to 21? There's a feeling that if your son or daughter is 18 years old and is able to serve in the armed forces and put their life on the line, that they should be able to have the ability to go and buy a tobacco product if they want to in North Carolina. Some others might say if the federal level is 21, then it's incumbent on the state to then conform to that and raise that age to 21. What do you think? Well, I guess I haven't come to a conclusion on that yet. Why not change the age? Um, I think that's a good question. I don't know if I have an answer for it, but I think that's a good question. I think that a person ought to have to be an adult. Now, that's what I believe personally. Um, right now is not quite like that. But do you think 18 or 21? Well, I think we ought to have the discussion and we haven't really had the discussion and I'm not sure where that'll go if we do. But I am surprised that you or the other lawmakers I've interviewed aren't willing to take more of a stand and say, no, it shouldn't be 18, federal's 21. And I think there's other gray areas in North Carolina, you know. So there's probably a lot of them. You know, it doesn't surprise me because North Carolina has a long history of a strong tobacco lobby. And, you know, it's unfortunate that we, you know, have not raised the age. I'd be taking multiple breaks during class to go and hit it. What the parents would tell us is, okay, our kid is clearly addicted from what you've said. What do we do? But there wasn't anything for kids. Next. North Carolina was the first state in the country to take Juul to court. We won $48 million, and we're using those funds to help kids who are addicted. Millions of dollars are going to text-based programs, quit lines, and research. The UNC School of Medicine received more than $880,000 to study vaping among young people. Well, we have a vaping cessation program for adults, but there wasn't anything for kids. Now, UNC has a program to help kids quit. My name is Oak Avery, and I'm 16 years old. Oak started vaping at 14. I would be hitting it multiple times a day. I'd be taking multiple breaks during class to go and hit it. Her mom caught her once, but she kept doing it. Then she got caught in school. It truly felt like walls were like crumbling down on to me like I think it was 100% my mom who was doing research into addiction therapy when she found that UNC had a program and found Charlie. My name is Charles Sapp and I'm a licensed clinical social worker and a licensed clinical addiction specialist. Charlie worked with Oak on why she was vaping. They figured out strategies to overcome cravings. We tailor it to the person. We don't force anything on anyone. I'm very glad that I was able to quit and had the help and support that I have. Now they want those one in eight high schoolers vaping to know help is out there. So it definitely is known among the parental community. I think that what they struggle with just as much as the kids struggle is finding the resources to help their kids. I mean, there's nobody in the world that want to go through what we've been through. There's nobody in the world that wants to attend a funeral for their own 15-year-old child a week and a half after his 15th birthday. Your hope is that we crack down every vape company, that we enforce the laws, that they can't have flavor vapes, that they can't look like toys, that we convince children there's no need to start.